Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. ARK Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARK. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARK or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARK to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARK Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI, ARK's weekly podcast on innovation and technology investing. This week, I talked to longtime Seeking Alpha contributor, Akram's Razor. Akram has written extensively about semiconductors, software, and macro. He foresaw and wrote about how the global crypto crash of 2018 would impact NVIDIA, which was largely ignored by sell-side analysts. In this first of our two-part interview, he goes through how he built his thesis and how it played out over the subsequent months. Okay. Akram, you've been following NVIDIA for quite some time before all the crypto craze and the AI craze. Give us a quick overview of how you got into the stock, what got you interested, and the, I guess, progression you've had over the last two or three years. All right, James, thanks for having me on. I mean, I guess where I would have started with NVIDIA would go back to 2015. So, I mean, I don't know how familiar you were with Mobileye then, but there was like the Mobileye craze circa, let's call it summer of 2015 right? Like if you had watched CNBC at that time, like Ron Barron gets on and he's like, Mobileye is Windows plus Intel combined. It's the next $100 billion company, Monopoly, et cetera, et cetera. They have this huge machine vision, monocular vision camera, detecting algorithms. You're never going to catch up to them, blah, 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 blah. So the stock was trading, which I found interesting. I mean, I've been trading semis for almost 20 years. So there's always something people get really excited about in semis. So when you're looking at it and you're doing your basic research just from a starting point, I'm like, look, if this is going to work out, you know, the IQ chips have got to be like, ultimately, it's got to be like a $10 ASP, you know, for high volume and automotive, right? Yeah. When you're thinking advanced drivers, assisted systems. I don't really, like, I didn't come into it with, as an, like an expert of anything on autonomy, but like I started doing work on the automotive value chain, right? And talking to people at like AutoLeave and Delphi and Bosch and whatnot to try to get a better sense of like what kind of market I was dealing with. And in that process, right, like, I mean, the one interesting thing about when I came at it is where was NVIDIA trading? I mean, people like tend to forget this, but NVIDIA at one point, when I put this short on and published on Mobileye in August of 2015, literally a week before that NASDAQ flash crash, I don't know if you remember when the NASDAQ fell 10% in a day. Vague memories. I was like, August 24th of 15 or whatever. Anyway, NVIDIA was half the enterprise value. Think about that. I mean, it's just, what about it's a, crazy. Like multiple sales or earnings or something. I mean, I'm saying like, talk about like 150 million or whatever revenue that Mobileye was doing. It was trading at 15 billion EV, right? Wow. So the stock was about literally where Intel bought them. 61 to $62, right? And NVIDIA was like 17, 18, right? With like a bunch of cash. So you netted it out. It was like a seven and a half billion EV. So the mobile eye business with this, you know, one little chip that basically doing, you know, automated braking, emergency braking and pedestrian detection, essentially the functionality at that time was worth more than NVIDIA's high end gaming business, NVIDIA's professional graphics business, what NVIDIA was starting to do in data center, et cetera, et cetera. And like that just on the surface to me was wrong because having started to do the work on it, like what were people using for training these algorithms? NVIDIA GPUs, right? So we're, they were training on NVIDIA GPUs and then doing very, very easy inference on mobile. Essentially, right? You bake it, you get it ready. And like, but the underlying tech for, you know, machine learning, deep learning, this was like my first intro to the machine learning, deep learning space. So you got to think about what this was like in 2015. Like I could reach out and these people would talk to you because nobody wanted to talk to them. It hadn't caught on. It's not like today where they're like essentially, you know, the equivalent of, you know, an NBA superstar or a rock star and, and like signing $5 million guaranteed deals and, and whatnot. 
there was good access in the community and ability to do work and develop some relationships. And in that process is, you know, I was very focused on the mobilized short thesis. And I mean, I had even talked to some people at NVIDIA in the summer of 15. And like, I mean, when did you leave NVIDIA? About the middle of 2015. All right. So if you remember, like the sell side hated NVIDIA's investments in CUDA, right? I mean, it was like every other conference call. It's like, you know, when is something going to come out of this, right? And they weren't getting any love for it. It was like, you're spending all this on R&D. What's coming out of it? And like, I was perplexed when I was looking at NVIDIA. You know, you want a bit of a frenemy. The enemy of, you know, my enemy is my friend. Yeah. So like when you reach out to NVIDIA, they had just started talking up their automotive game. And I was like, guys, like, look at where your stock is trading. I mean, this, this is remarkable. Like, do you guys have an opinion on this? Are you going to do a giant buyback? Like, is the sell side not getting your message? You know, is everything you're doing vaporware? Because it seems like the GPU is gaining traction. What did they say to you in response? I mean, they obviously weren't as bullish as I was on NVIDIA shares. I mean, you know, you get the typical, we're undervalued. Yeah, whatever, mobilize a bit crazy. But it wasn't like, yeah, we're about to go up 15x. I mean, you, you tell me, did you think when you left NVIDIA, it was going to be 20 times as valuable in like two years? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't feel that way because I mean AI came out in a way that I don't think that was not in the plan, so to speak, right? That was NVIDIA has been trying to grow its business outside of core gaming numerous times. Mobile was one instance. MP3 players with Porter Player was one instance. They've they've tried many times. So every time there's a great story of how we're gonna grow 510X, but you see the reality it not panning out. So HPC, that business built on basically GPUs doing high performance computing has been around for a while, but it was not a gangbusters business. It wasn't at all obvious internally that AI was gonna deep learning was gonna come around and every Google and hyperscale company was just gonna buy a crap load of these GPUs. I agree, but they were investing in it. And they were investing in the software platform for, you know, general purpose processing on a GPU, right? Yes. And to a degree, the development had started to take off somewhat. I mean, it is funny when you think about them versus Google. I mean, like, you know, Jeff Dean was a keynote at I.O. And like he'd get up there and like Google would introduce him. And we love NVIDIA. We buy tons of GPUs. You know, how long ago was that? Three years, two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there was that element. But yeah, I mean, look, if I had thought it was going to take off like that, you know, I would have put everything in, you know, NVIDIA call options versus sure. being short mobile. I and mean, mobile, I fell 50% and it was like event driven and so on and so forth. But I did better actually on the NVIDIA long, you know, than I did on mobile. But I was not nearly as aggressive with the NVIDIA long on options. But to me, it was a nice pair trade, right? It's like I get this whole data center thing that I can't really quantify AI, whatever. It's like a free call option, autonomous driving, free call option. And I personally think the core gaming and professional graphics business is worth a hell of a lot more than the market's giving it right now. So like, that's where I came into it, right? And I mean, I guess that's a nice element of backstory. It's funny that you mentioned Portal Player. I was short that when Apple announced that they were giving the iPod video business to Broadcom, uh, right? I see. So like, that used to be the type of stuff you really would love looking for in, in like specialty semiconductors, like a hot gadget. I mean, I did it with FPDs on the Genesis microchip. I mean, I remember shorting the DVD chip stock, Zoron. I mean, there's always been one. I mean, even Mellanox, which NVIDIA just bought recently, I had a good background on from the HPC side because I published a short report on that in like 2011. They had this like huge explosion on the InfiniBand end when Intel's Romley upgrade cycle was delayed. And then like everybody, when once it came out, this pent up demand, everybody upgraded in HPC and Mellanox went from like 40 to 120 in like three months and then all the way right back down, right? I think I published at 120. Yeah, that was kind of a freak event through Mellanox's kind of a stock history. I think the, the interesting point here is that you don't take a permanent view on any of these companies. You've been positive and I guess bearish on them depending on the setup. And you really, your first exposure to NVIDIA was on the long side, a positive outlook. How did your view change since and what's happened in the last year? NVIDIA has gone through this AI and crypto driven cycle, but it's kind of come down a lot as that inventory build has surprised everyone. How have you responded to kind of the last year or so? So look, I think you got to break this up into two pieces, right? So like after I finished with that mobile eye NVIDIA trade, NVIDIA hit 100, you know, I pretty much exited completely. Then there was this like wave of semi consolidation, right? And let's call that it started in early 2016. Like I bought AMD, for example, 
in early 2016, the day after it rose 50% in a day, mm. right? Like AMD honestly looked like it was going out of business, like February 2016. Sure. And there was that turn in the market in tech, a bunch of stuff started getting going. And I was looking for semi-longs and I went into Broadcom. I thought Broadcom should be acquired. It frustrated me. I was buying short dated call options on that. I went through that cycle in the chip space. And then I watched NVIDIA, you know, go ballistic, but I wasn't spending as much time on it. And fast forward to this crypto, like you get into 2017 and this crypto thing starts. And I think I found myself, it was like the end of 17 and, you know, everybody's trading cryptocurrencies. And I had been familiar with crypto, very familiar because a former really good friend was like really into the space. And, you know, he'd been talking to me about Bitcoin from like 2010, you know, but I'd never taken an interest on it from the investment side. And once it really started blowing up, I started looking into the mining space, right? Because I was like, what's driving this mining? Everybody's setting up mining farms. And I wanted to, you know, revisit because I remember when AMD got hit with, was it 2000, maybe 12? I don't remember. AMD went through like a mini crypto bust, right? Do you remember that one? NVIDIA was less involved in it. No, not the first first cycle with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what got me interested. And like I started doing work on the mining space. And the mining space was kind of, it was really interesting once you really understood it. It It's like, I can quantify exactly how many GPUs are. Like once you figured out that the crypto mining was altcoins, it's Ethereum, you know, Zcash, honestly, the market was probably like 95% Ethereum, right? Yeah. But once you nailed that down and you started talking to miners and I visited a couple large mining farms and you just would see them, you'd see like, you know, the piles of the boxes and these just NVIDIA GPUs everywhere, the gaming Pascal cards. I'm not talking about the OEM, you know, not branded. Sure. And you're like, huh, commodity boom bust, right? Inventory correction that enters your head immediately. When you went to visit these places firsthand, I guess most people's impression was the crypto Ethereum mining was mostly AMD, but you saw that NVIDIA had quite strong exposure as well. And it wasn't their so known OEM SKUs that they had kind of- Bro, that goes, in retrospect, that is maybe one of the dumbest things that ever happened in that I don't understand how nobody else picked up on it. It was a market shares game, right? AMD had just come out with Vega and AMD did not seem to be thinking about competing with NVIDIA with Vega. It was just rushing it to meet Apple's demand, right? Mm -hmm. And I honestly think AMD had completely seeded the gaming market in terms of Vega. They were happy with whatever demand they were getting from you know the old Radeon cards from the previous generation on the crypto. But who had the biggest market share in discrete GPUs? Like what is it, 85, 15, 80, 20 at the time, mm-hmm. right? So all you had to do was do the math, understand the supply constraints that AMD has. AMD has been through this bust. AMD is focused on the CPU. AMD does not want to get burned. AMD can't compete, right? And like there has to be a lead time here with global foundries and they're trying to get out of that relationship, all this stuff that AMD was happy to take what came, right? Now, NVIDIA is sitting there as this giant who's producing, you know, 80% of the discrete cards in the market and the demand went through the roof. So it was a simple market share analysis at that point. Like the sell side was publishing reports about AMD's risks for mining when it was trading at $9, right? And saying NVIDIA is fine, not nearly as exposed at, you know, $240. That made no sense to me. Now, where did you get the sense that, because at the time, everyone said basically miners were choosing AMD GPUs. Did you get any firsthand read that in fact, the mining market share reflected the general market share in gaming? Okay. So all you had to do is do the math on an Ethereum hash rate, right? Watch it, figure out the average hash of these graphics cards and how many GPUs need to be bought, right? Where are they going to come from? Where is like an extra couple million GPUs going to come from in the discrete market? They have to come from NVIDIA. I see. You're saying basically if you use up all of AMD supply, there's not enough hashes there to supply the known hashes needed for the Ethereum blockchain at that point. And you have the splits. You could look at the revenue and just be like, all right, I mean, this is what AMD is producing. But you had to be thinking about it tactically. AMD has been through this. AMD outsmarted them like, you know, Lisa Sue outsmarted Jensen big time here. She was focused on Intel. Intel's got a process problem. She's coming after them with Ryzen, right? Mm -hmm. And she wants to get data center share there. Like everybody on the hyperscale side is happy. Like the whole planet is happy to see AMD be more competitive against Intel, right? 
So that's where they're focusing. She picked her battle. She brought Vega out. They branded it as like, hey, we're going to come to the gamers. But did they really? You know, like she basically guaranteed herself a nice transition with the Apple deal, right? So wait, this Vega thing, I still want to kind of better understand. Were they deliberate? Like, was that chip just not performant due to poor design? Did they have to choose where they allocated wafers for the CPU, GPUs? How do you mean like they went for CPUs and they kind of just let Vega out? No, no. I'm saying that like you have to view it from a strategic argument. So they were focused on CPU, set that aside. If you look at their graphics roadmap, right, like to bring Vega to market when they did and basically not be competitive yet really even with soon to be sunsetting Pascal, right? Mm -hmm. They framed it as, hey, you know, we have this for gamers, but they did not take an approach like that. You couldn't find, you know, the 64 and what was it, the 56 cards. I mean, if you look at what they did at one point, they played the memory game with the Frontier Edition, right? AMD's contract manufacturing that when the miners took off, right? And they're earning like an extra $250 margin. There was process issues too with the way they were designing Vega in terms of constraints. So all I'm trying to say is that AMD had a roadmap decision where like, hey, we're not going to focus on gaming right now. We're going to focus on the CPU side with what we're doing, which was where their primary focus was. We'll take what revenue we're getting here and you know, we'll provide this in terms of transition wise architecture, but like from a volume ramp investment, it wasn't like, hey, we're going to produce as but like we're going to contract produce as many GPUs as we can because we're going to be able to compete with NVIDIA. They couldn't have, right? From a gamer standpoint. I see. So you're saying they made the minimum, almost the minimum amount possible to fulfill their obligations to Apple and some of the trickle through went to crypto. I look at it even as better than that, James. I look at it as Apple essentially financed a lot more of their roadmap development by guaranteeing them like, you know, this contracted demand, which is something AMD has been doing. This is what part of NVIDIA's problem and success story is, you know, Jensen believes he's selling Ferraris, right? Mm -hmm. So like he doesn't play nice with Apple. He didn't play nice with Linux. You know, Sony and Microsoft, you know, have been happy to be doing business with AMD. And NVIDIA's view is we don't want that low margin business, right? Yes. That's an interesting perspective on Apple because maybe it's even as true as that because Apple in a way needs to keep AMD alive or else they would eventually fall into a single vendor situation on GPUs and be forced to buy NVIDIA. I mean, it's in everybody's interest, right? Yeah. So particularly if you were, to, if like, I mean, he's not shy about it. So if you ever to listen to NVIDIA's CEO talk, and we can only imagine what goes on behind the scenes, right? Because Tim Cook took over from the Steve Jobs era. Obviously, Jobs and Jensen didn't get along. That's mm. obvious, yeah. right? And that was well known, and he wasn't shy about that, right? They had some warranty it, issues. It seems like it's carried on. Yeah, it certainly seems. I mean, Tim Cook is a supply chain person, so he's all about driving down costs and having multiple vendors. So that's not surprising either. So you went into this, and you saw that crypto was kind of turning into this little bubble. And you saw that basically NVIDIA had to have large exposure because AMD wasn't supplying enough GPUs to sustain the Ethereum hash rate at that time. And how did you end up, I guess, reacting to that? Well, I mean, once I got going with that thesis, I obviously started doing some work. I mean, I was surprised, like I said, that so many people missed it. Like, I mean, I even talked to what's it called? John Petty Research, sure. who covers the graphics space, right? And putting out market share numbers regularly, thousands of dollars for report, really nice guy. But like, here I am being like, yo, bro, there's like maybe a once in a decade thing going on here in your market, right? <laughs> and I just showed up looking for a commodity bust and boom and bust, like almost the same way I was looking at in actual commodities like frac sand several years earlier. And I'm just like, this is a pickaxe and you know, it's worth doing some more work on here. And it's just like people weren't interested, right? Like NVIDIA kind of was managing it. Jensen was framing it. If you go back to his, the Q1 call and like, you know, peak crypto, like Ethereum's 1200 and Bitcoin's like 17,000 or whatever. Yeah. And they like, and gaming's up 56% or whatever it was that quarter. And they asked him like, you know, what's driving gaming? And his answer literally was like Fortnite and PUBG. They were really good for us. That's it. Yeah. And what you're insinuating here for our listeners who haven't followed this saga, like blow by blow very closely, NVIDIA's gaming business grew close to 50% for a couple of quarters year over year. Gaming, first half of 2018. Yeah. First half of 2018. And gaming has never grown at that rate since like maybe a decade ago. So it was very strange and analysts sell side were trying to figure out why. And Jensen basically said those two popular games, these kind of free for all deathmatch games were driving the revenues when in fact it was crypto behind the scenes all along. Yeah. I mean, you know, there was an interesting element to it because of, I guess, the way they contract with the channel and their add-in board partners and whatnot. 
Like NVIDIA's revenues on the gaming side were like, what, 20% up in 2017? And let's say the whole crypto thing started in May of 17. Like it seeded a little earlier, but got going in May and ran all the way through the end of the year, right? And then they started doing the OEM business that last quarter of 17. And they got another big fat one. And then the first quarter of 18, at least calendar 18, then not their physical quarters, right? Yeah. But what I was curious on is had they raised prices on the channel, right? Sure. And this is where NVIDIA is like a complete total headache of a stock in the sense that they don't ever talk anything about platform volumes versus ASPs, right? So you're looking at it and you have to fish. And I mean, you know, ironically, you know, there's tons of ad inboard partners. They're publicly listed in Taiwan and they're much easier to get a hold of and talk to, right? And there was tons of miners and you could talk to them and be like, what are you getting quoted on a large order? And they're like, you know, it's went up to this because NVIDIA raised the prices on the channel. <laughs> mm. I'm like, all right, thank you. How much did they raise the price on the channel? I mean, it would be nice if they would tell us, mm. right? But I can tell you that when I published a postmortem on NVIDIA, if you looked at PC Partner, right, which has the, which one of the gaming lines do they have for them? PC Partners, Taiwan. Is Zotac here? Is it Zotac? Zotac, no, is, Zotac, one that Zotac you talk is AMD. About. No. The exclusive AMD partner got completely destroyed, right? Uh-huh. I mean, that was, no, that was the other one. Is PC Partner? Yeah, PC Partner was Zotac. That's right. I'm thinking of, it's like a small specialty AMD shop. Anyway, Zotac is exclusively NVIDIA, right? Yeah. And they break out gaming cards, branded gaming, GPUs, and units, and what's OEM on the side. And you can see first half of 2018 versus first half of 2017, their gaming branded NVIDIA business, flat. Like, flat unit-wise. So it's like, all right, well, how did you grow revenue 50%? Like, you could start piecing it together from different parts of the channel, and you had switch in there a little bit, but like, there was an element of ASP, right? And we had leaks, you know, these things started, if you look at the chip industry, like, you know, supply chain, what do you call them? Like websites who comment on this stuff, like what's it called? EE Times, what's it called in the UK? They put out reports. Digitimes? Not Digitimes. There's the big one in Asia. Anyway, it's irrelevant. But like they literally came out when crypto crashed in February, they're like AMD and NVIDIA are raising prices on the partners to protect themselves right? Hmm. On the channel. So like, I think that was posted in February. So you got to think to yourself, all right, how long does this take to filter through, right? That's the trick with this. So it was maybe a six month window you had to kind of nail it down. I think where NVIDIA really screwed things up for everybody is once crypto busted and they were done with it, right? The price had fallen off, but there was still a stretch of demand where the miners were still making money in Ethereum. So the hash rate peaked in August. Price peaked in February, right? Yeah. So you still had some steady demand, but they took this view. I don't, do you remember when NVIDIA put that tweet out, supplies on the way? Like, no, I don't. May of 2018. You're saying hash rates did not peak into August of 18? Yeah. Oh, I see. So there's actually more GPUs going on the network as price came down because you could still make money. So they were still gobbling up GPUs. And adding them in there to generate money once GPU prices collapsed, expecting a comeback. So there's a delayed effect, right? Not everyone's going to throw in the towel on mining. So I'm sitting there. I'm like, all right, this is just going to get better and better. But what really put this thing over the top was Jensen. I couldn't have asked for a better person from a short standpoint because he comes out in June and he's like, you know, new cards aren't going to be out for a while. You're like, what? What the, what the hell's a while? <laughs> so, you know? So. Like he's literally playing the channel. Gamers are frustrated. What are you doing? What's going on? And he's like, Pascal, sunsetting. I'm going to milk this one last time. I've raised pricing. And then I'm going to bring Turing at higher pricing and maintain higher ASPs, you know? And like, great, fantastic, amazing. Now, look at the ad and board partners, what was going on in June when he's saying this. They're collapsing. Revenues are collapsing. They're literally complaining to NVIDIA. Stuff is being leaked. I mean, I did that one where that guy leaked the email exchange or whatever that they tried to put inventory back to NVIDIA. And NVIDIA basically went into the AIB channel. It was just like, listen, if you're not going to play ball here on the Pascal, you're going to move to the back of the line on Turing. And like, listen, you want to be in the back of the line of Turing? What's AMD got coming for you, right? And if you're looking at these guys and where they're sitting, and what's happening in that market, they're banking on a rebound, a big one, right? So what do they have to do but you know, trust in Jensen and NVIDIA, right? 
I can only imagine the disgruntledness that has developed over the last eight months because they definitely rammed that down their throats, right? I mean, with the stuff that was coming out in June, where we already had signs of an inventory issue, it had to be a plan inside NVIDIA that Turing is going to save the day and the demand is going to be gangbusters because of ray tracing, you know? I mean, I still remember, like, you know, I mean, I don't think between, you know, Jim Cramer and his dog and maybe even you <laughs> a couple times in, in, in the summer of 18 watching CNBC and I was thinking about creating a dartboard and throwing darts at it. <laughs> but watching Jensen get up there, I had bought puts because NVIDIA reported earnings August of 18. I let that go through. I was just looking for softness in data center and we'll get to the when we get to the AI. But I bought some really near dated puts. I'm like, nobody is this stupid, right? Mm-hmm. Like what's going on here? The evidence just kept getting better and better and better. And the stock is up, right? I'm like, this is like a nuclear bomb is about to go off in this channel because I'm sitting on tracking the secondhand market and the GPUs. And it's like the gamers were already frustrated with where prices went on Pascal. You're going to double the prices on Turing? And like, yes, ray tracing is impressive. It's let's call it half baked or whatever you want to do. But they were so frustrated with what had happened. Like the, the risks that were being taken there were so enormous. And I put this like short term options trade on in, in August. And the next day after the Thursday reported, Friday, NVIDIA was like down a little bit. Uh, the data center numbers looked a little bit softer than I expected. So I was happy. Monday, I'm, you know, I'm still short. The event starts for the Turing launch on the gaming. They already did the professional, uh, what's called one earlier, like a week earlier, two weeks earlier. Like he stands on stage, real-time ray tracing. You know, he's holding up, you know, the RTX 2080, like it's the new iPhone. And he's like, there you have it, real-time ray tracing for 1500 bucks a pop or whatever it was at launch. And the stock took off. Was it over $1,000? I mean, the 2080 Ti, definitely, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Still over 1000 today. Way over, way over. Yeah. So like, yeah, at that point, you were very surprised. So I mean, they gambled big. So right? let's just like recircle. And I think you had a very complex narrative there. If I were to try to summarize in my own mind, crypto blew up, specifically Ethereum mining, highly profitable. So miners bought a ton of GPUs. AMD didn't have enough to supply it because they were just planning to supply enough for Apple. They had that obligation. So in reality- I would say break the AMD down into two parts. One, there's existing market share, right? Yeah. NVIDIA was already way bigger, all right? And consider the size of that bubble that occurred. There was no way, even if AMD wanted to play ball, they could absorb it. But the other part of it is that AMD was at a point strategically where they had wisely picked a battle that they were going to fight with Intel on CPU and a roadmap for data center, GPU, and not nearly as focused on gaming. If you would look at gaming, it had to be at the bottom of their list. They want to improve margins. Remember, AMD is the biggest supplier to both the Xbox and the PlayStation, right? Sure. So you've got that pipeline for the refresh on that side coming out. So it was tactically a wise move. Okay. So AMD did very little to supply kind of the crypto demand. NVIDIA had to do it. The market didn't think that was the case. The NVIDIA, I think people read a bunch of stories about AMD GPUs being more efficient for mining, and they assumed AMD had some kind of better share there. And this caused basically the demand was so high, NVIDIA raised prices, probably on the order of maybe 50, 40%. I don't think that much. We could say maybe they took a price hike that had to be in the 25% ranges of some sort in that first half of 2018. Oh, okay. Then what do you attribute the rest of the growth? That- There's a mix, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, here, look, you were bullish on the company, right? This is the way I look at this when I'm talking to someone like you. Ask NVIDIA. Like, if I'm a believer in a stock like this, and we'll get into this on the AI, like Intel reports all this stuff. This was a $200 billion company in September of last year. $200 billion, the same size, almost literally on par with Intel. Intel gives you platform ASP, platform volumes, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like this is such an important thing in investing in semiconductors. Even AMD on their calls will tell you ASP drove this in GPU, units were down, right? And that impacted the mix. They never talk about any of this and and not a single time have I seen, listened to an NVIDIA call where an analyst asked them that question. So it's like, what are, it's covered by like 35 people, right? It had to have been the, one of the most widely owned things ever. Yeah. And I don't have, if I'm long the stock, I want to know, like, what, am I just investing in Jensen on blind faith alone? Is that what it's supposed to be? 
You know, if it's the same market cap as Intel, why don't they feel the need to disclose that information? Well, you have companies like Apple, who's you know a trillion dollar company, who basically de-disclosed those metrics for their products line. No more ASPs and units. Correct. And that was super controversial last summer, right? Mm-hmm. Because everybody's looking at the iPhone and they're looking at what the ASP was on it in 2007, right? Yep. And what the ASP is on it now. I mean, like, you know, I bought a new iPhone like two months ago, or like $1,300, right? What were you paying for iPhone at launch? $600? Couple hundred. Even $450 maybe? Yep. But like it's integrating more and more functionality. I'm not just buying a phone. I like I've replaced my video camcorder, my camera, you know, my notebook, like to a degree, a huge part of my computer. So many things. So if you were to think on the grand scheme of like what has got into it, it's a big deal. What has the GPU essentially been replacing from a gaming standpoint, right? It's processing power still at the end of the day, right? But if Jensen tells a story, he'll be like, Well, it costs to make a new amazing game today $150 million. It's like a movie, right? Obviously, the investments being made there, the investments on the graphics end had to be higher. Well, actually, you know, those games today are cheaper than the games that cost, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to develop in the late 80s, right? What were you paying for Mike Tyson's punch out, you know, in 1986 or 87 or whatever it was? And, you know, what are you paying for Fortnite now? That business model has changed. Games in the 80s, inflation adjusted is more expensive to produce than Call of Duty? Not the cost of production. I'm saying, what does the game retail for? Oh. Sure. Some of them are being given away for free and they're making money off the add-ons, right? What's inflation adjusted sixty nine ninety nine from like 1986? Yeah. I, I guess right? Jensen's point, and we can debate if it's accurate, is that the production cost, the production values have grown quite exponentially to get to a Call of Duty cinema level kind of experience. Okay. But this is the way he makes the point. This is my point. Of course it has, right? These games, some of them do take like 100 million plus in development. The point is they sell them for what price? Well, yeah, not an exponentially so more expensive price. To do yeah. the comparison, you know, over that time is a completely different. Like, it, it's not apples to apples, right? So, like the discrete GPU market, like, I mean, I don't know where you are on this, but like, if you look at it from, like, a lot of people, if you looked at Nvidia, right, it had many secular themes in its favor, right? You got professional graphics, you got esports, right, like the boom in gaming, you got data center AI, you mm-hmm. got autonomous driving, which is you know tangential to that, right? So, I mean, it had those four really nice stories, but like I look at esports gaming and I'm like, I watch these kids today, how much they're playing on mobile games. I look at NVIDIA's units and I look at how much notebook, let's say, has gone on, which is not necessarily the best thing for them the longer term, particularly if you think about, you know, APUs and combining the GPU with the CPU and whatnot. Yep. And I think about like, is the discrete market in the US even growing? If we back out crypto and all this, I don't think so. Right, so he needs price. He needs that lever. Like, what's your addressable market for the person who builds a thirty-five hundred dollar rig? Yeah, I don't think they're making that claim either. I think every time they've talked about gaming growing, they've talked about developing countries. They've talked a lot about China. I think they've talked about Turkey in the past. But yeah, we don't hear a lot, even from Nvidia, that you know North America is a growing. I'm market. I'm saying with the secular tailwind in emerging markets, the units don't look like on the discrete gaming side that they are growing. Right, so. Like this is something that you want to get into that like price has been a big driver. Sure, sure. Right? So he needs to be consistently selling you a premium product. That's the story there, right? Yes. And that premium product always had one comp to go against. But I don't really, when I look at NVIDIA's gaming, I don't view AMD as their biggest competitor right now. I view social, I view mobile gaming. Like, I mean, right now the best thing NVIDIA has is like, you know, I don't know, how old are you? I'm 35. Okay, I'm 41. Like, I think it's, let's start with you and go up in terms of generation, like the people who are willing to spend the money and invest in the rigs. But when I think about like, you know, the five to 15 year olds and the level of way they're able to play a game on an iPad and a phone and the amount of time they get into it, Mm -hmm. like we're sunsetting this new generation, like mobile is their way to go. And where is an NVIDIA and mobile gaming? Well, that's, I mean, this has happened already for mobile gaming isn't like a 2018 phenomenon. Mobile gaming has been happening for a while. If anything, it seems like mostly it's expanded the market. I don't think it's reduced the units of kind of AAA console games. I think the fact that consoles have survived to this era is actually evidence that they're basically two very different market segments. No, I think you have three market segments too. You have the PC gamer, you got the console gamer, you have the mobile gamer, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But what we're talking about is from a revenue standpoint for an NVIDIA, I'm saying their sweet spot really is that older gamer who's a PC gamer 
who's willing to you know build a two thousand to three thousand dollar high end rig, right? And I'd say that is the core market there. Let's look in terms of outside of growing the gaming is let's say more people over thirty, right? But of course, with esports and whatever, there's going to be guys who are going to want to build a rig and emulate the superstar and whatnot, right? But I think from like it's a market that is much more driven by price than organic units. And with notebook gaming, you know, they're doing well there right now. But like that's an even one with with bigger risk, right? I mean, look at the end of the day, the processor is an issue. Like if you got excited about esports, would you really buy Nvidia because of esports? I mean, esports seems like a consumption market to me, but I think that's a very long discussion we can have. But I still want to get back to kind of your story about the setup that NVIDIA went through with crypto. So they saw the demand, they increased prices, and they kept the prices high even when the prices for Ethereum started crashing in kind of beginning of 18. And well, I mean, again, we can't draw that conclusion. They did a couple things, right? They did an OEM business directly to the miners right? Mm -hmm. Which is like guaranteed money. You're not taking really any channel risk. They're ordering from you, right? Right. And on the other end, they have what they're supplying the gaming market, right? But like the gaming market, I mean, there's guys renting planes and buying the cards before they hit the distribution channel, right? So it's like, it's not even before it even gets to a retailer. Like one of the funniest things I viewed on this, it was like, if you were actively trying to trade cards, I bought a couple 1080 TIs for used and I bought one U like in August for, you know, 300 bucks, 350, 320. I don't remember. These things were almost 2000 at one point. Yeah. Right. And the ability to trade up on a card. There's a guy who's actually a pretty notable guy. Do you ever follow Ashraf Isa? Sure. Yeah. So, like, I've known Ashraf for a while. He was trading these cards, like, you know, all last year. You know, like, he sold his stuff at the top of the market and he just traded up. Right. So, when you looked at it, it was like, okay. I can't find an NVIDIA gaming card. So like this concept, when the gaming revenue comes out, it's like, what is, like Jensen, just please explain it to me. Fortnite and PUBG, nobody can find the frigging cards. They have not been on Amazon or on a shelf for the last three and a half months, right? Okay, so you're saying they raised prices. That's what drove substantially the revenue growth. You didn't think Jensen handled that episode very well. What do you think he should have done kind of heading off the beginning of 18? You tell me, looking back on it, it started out with, you know, we love crypto. Crypto is here to stay. Three months later, it was like, yeah, crypto is going to go through its volatility to it, but it's kind of immaterial to us, right? And we're going to guide for this crypto and we're factoring no crypto revenue into our guidance. Now, this is obviously misleading because if I'm out there looking for a card and I can't find one, right? And your gaming line is up, you know, 50% year over year. And if I back out whatever switch was at the time, I do the math, like, Who's been buying the cards? There's a mix of price and the end demand is the miners. Those miners, when it collapses, they just bought cards that they're going to turn net sellers off, right? Mm -hmm. So do you think they should have actually cut back the prices after maybe the price increase should have been temporary? I mean, like you don't change prices once. You didn't raise prices the year before, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know their terms with their add-in board partners, right? But I think if you take a price hike, I think things got more complicated. Like we said, if you go back to when the June story came out of one of the add-in board partners trying to return 300,000 GPUs, was it, right? Something like that? Were you following that in June? No. Anyway, it's immaterial. Like, I can't find it right now. But the point is, is they did this, right? Okay. And you had the channel puking up Pascal. And NVIDIA managed this. They had a strategy clearly behind the scenes because there's no other explanation for it with the planning, there has to be a roadmap, right? You work there, you walk me through it. What's the roadmap if you're about to introduce a new graphics card from the first launch to what you've contracted with TSM to everything? I mean, this the lead times on this stuff, we're talking about a year of planning, right? Sure. So he knows when he's coming out, he's good thinking on pricing and he's looking at that market and he's saying, all right, crypto's crashed. There's pent up gaming demand. Supply is on the way. That was NVIDIA's tweet in May, right? And then he stands up and he says to people at the big gaming conference in June of last year. And he says, don't expect new cards for a while. Well, I mean, I guess in his mind, a while is, you know, exactly 60 days, right? So go out and buy whatever Pascal supplies just come out. So I don't really know if you can objectively look at this and be like, what could he have done differently when this looks like a designed plan to milk the market that went wrong, right? Otherwise, they're incompetent. You tell me. 
But the net effect was to keep prices high and basically create a continuous price heading into the Turing launch. Correct. I'm going to cash in on Pascal sunsetting one last time because nobody could get cards. Mining's collapsed, right? If I viewed my gaming demand as actually organic gaming, you know, why would I come out there, right? I had just had two monster quarters. I'm going to push this down on my channel with a new lineup coming out. Isn't that pulling demand forward ahead of my higher ASP new launch that I want to look great because it's got ray tracing? Or do I expect the guy who bought a six hundred and ninety nine dollar ten eighty Ti in June to come back and spend you know more than twice that in September? I don't know. That's it for this week. Next week, Akram and I go through Nvidia's data center business in depth and assess the growing competitive landscape for AI accelerators. You can find the full Arc team on Twitter. Arc believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that Arc believes to be reliable. However, Arc does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from Arc. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on Arc's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.